Friends, we are indeed begging for disaster. The way that modern society is moving forward, Western economies, we are setting up for a massive disaster. I am coming to you from the heart of the European Union here in Paris, France, a nation that followed a similar course to the United States. It imploded from printing money and had a massive social upheaval and a massive revolution. Friends, we might have a few things to learn from them. We're going to talk about what's going on right now today and how some of the parallels with the uh, French economy, French government, right after the American Revolution as they went into the French Revolution. Let's jump into it. Welcome to the Poplar Report. I'm Steve Poplar. I'm an accountant by trade. And uh, we are coming to you from Paris as I stop through uh, connecting trains. I had to jump from one station to the other and I said, hey, why don't I run downtown and uh, get in front of the Eiffel Tower and shoot you guys a video? I know it's pretty lame, Eiffel Tower and all that kind of stuff like that, but uh, um, it's it, they got some nice parks here and stuff like that. Um, I was surprised to find this park because they had boxed up all the other parks. Anyway, let's jump into it. So today we have this arrogance of, of price and quantity at all costs get the price down as low as possible, get the quantity up as high as possible. And when it really comes to quality and, and sustainability, I don't want to use that word sustainability so much, but, but dependability. Where we used to make parts near the factories, you used to have a business and when they needed parts and ingredients, they would look around them to their neighborhoods, to their state, to other places in their nation to find those parts, find those, um, those ingredients. But now it's not uncommon for even simple food products, simple pro uh, products that you find on the store to have parts or components that were made in two, three, sometimes 10 or more countries. When you look at your car, when you look at um, a, like a Boeing jetliner or something like that, you're talking about parts are coming from all over the world. Now, a monsoon that hits Shanghai, like one just did, uh, monsoon is basically just a hurricane. They call hurricanes monsoons, which cool for them. Uh, but they, they just got hit with a, a powerful hurricane. And, th and that messed up their shipping, messed up a lot of the delivery timelines. And uh, there are companies all across the United States and Europe that are scrambling right now because of this issue in Shanghai, China. And that may make sense for budgetary purposes, right? You save money on that. You can pass the savings on to uh, people so that they buy more of your product, which makes sense. But there's a limit to that where you have to start thinking about sustainability. You have to start thinking about how dependable is your supply chain. If something happens in one of the 30 places where you're getting components from, suddenly you're, you have a problem. That combined with the fact that they have worked on this uh, just-in-time uh, processing, just-in-time inventory, so that, uh, that just as they need the products, just as they need the parts, that's when they arrive. They order more parts just as they're using them up, and they have very little in inventory. Now, for a manufacturing plant, that means that when you have one component stop, you have to shut down production across the entire plant. We've been having a lot of reports of that ever since the cough cough. We've been having reports of that happening one place after the next after the next. The sustainability of our entire system. Uh, I, I call them Franken foods. Uh, I know some other uh, people on YouTube call them that uh, Franken foods. You got your Franken products. These products that are cobbled together out of just sometimes top, toxic stuff uh, or cheap stuff. The fact that you have products that are designed to break. And that's so frustrating. It's not just that they made them cheap. It's that they designed them to break. Where did, where did the whole quality and dependability thing go? Well, there just wasn't as much money in it, apparently. So we have all that going on. We got... Um, uh, we got the central bank digital currencies, which that hasn't been big in the news, but they are pushing that stuff hard. They're working on it. Uh, the FedNow system is fully operational. Uh, almost all U.S. banks are now on that. Most credit unions are on the FedNow system. So basically, it's going to replace the SWIFT system. So it's not central bank digital currency for you and I just yet, but it is for all the banks. 
It's going to make it a lot easier to transfer money to from one uh, bank to the next, from one account to the next, theoretically. Uh, but if you think that's gonna save you money, well, you're wrong there. If you think it's gonna take less time to get money from one bank to the next, why does it take three or four days, five days, six days, seven days sometimes on holidays for them to just verify a transaction, but then you swipe your credit card and boom, that, that thing goes through in like two or three seconds. How does that make sense? Well, it makes sense if it's, if it doesn't bother them that it takes a transaction a while, they can freeze your money, they can go play with your money on the stock market for, for a few days, and then um, eventually free it up and send it over to the bank that you want to have it at. That's, that sounds cynical, and yet that's exactly what they do with it. They want to have your deposits, and they're literally holding onto your deposits just so they can play with your money. Um, we, uh, <laughs> We, uh, we have the central bank, bank digital currency coming into play. And why do they want to do that? They want to make it so that cash is irrelevant. And uh, what they're saying now is that uh, people both in, the, in Europe as well as in the United States are saying, uh, from the governments, are saying that they think that if they switch everyone off of cash into, currency, uh, into digital currency, that they will uh, find an additional 35% taxes they think that tax revenues will go up by 35% if they get everyone onto central bank digital currency. Now, we haven't ever done it in the United States, and so if you're from the US, you're gonna be like, what? That sounds absolutely insane. Yet the European Union has done it uh, on numerous occasions, and other countries have done it uh, quite frequently too, where they basically take old bills and they decirculate them. Everyone has to turn in their currency to get new currency. And it's not that they're, that they're necessarily having a massive inflation kind of thing, but the simple fact is, is that, that if you try using one of the old bills, they'll just, they won't accept it. And the United States basically pulls currency out of circulation, right? But it's been a very long time since we've actually said that piece of currency is no longer currency anymore. Um, but yet we see the European Union has done that with the Euro. And that's one of the reasons why central banks around the world can't stockpile euros is because they know that the euro today won't be the euro of tomorrow or next year or whenever the European Union decides to uh, change it again. But that's coming to the United States. They're going to look at your dollars and say, those are old dollars. You have to go to the bank, turn those in, get the new dollars before you can come back to the shop and spend them. And why do they want to do that? They want to crack down on anyone, quote unquote, hoarding cash. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where they're going with all this. They want to get rid of this. Uh, they want to get rid of cash. And if they can't get rid of cash, the intermediary method that they can do is they can have these uh, runs where they basically make you turn in all of your cash so they can record it, record how much you have, and then they can turn around give you the new cash, but they now have those records. And they're gonna say, next time they phase out the cash again, they go, well, where'd all that cash go? Or how'd you get all this extra cash? We see how much you've pulled out of the bank in the last two years, but you have all this extra cash that you haven't reported as income. You see, how the, you see where they're going with all this? And of course, we got World War III. Uh, always brewing on the horizon, the European Union pushing us uh, into war, and of course the politicians in Washington, D.C. doing the same. I, I don't know where all these people are that want to go to war, um, because it's the politicians, and that's, that's all I'm hearing it from, politicians. So I promised you to talk a little bit about France here. we got some interesting history here. Um, I, I keep talking about foreign interventions and giving it away all of the United States' wealth to other countries that are poor and desperate and in need and all this kind of stuff. Well, France did that to the United States. Back during the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin came over here to France and uh, uh, smooth-talked France into helping uh, the United States to the tune of 1.3 billion livres. And that's a lot, that's a lot of money. He got them to give us a ton of money. So much so that between that and the war that it dragged them into with, uh, with uh, the UK, 
arguably they would have gotten into the war with the UK anyway, but um, um, let's just say we helped that along for sure. Between those two things, that basically was the straw that broke the French uh, economy. They had a massive economic crisis due to the debt collapse. The debt collapse of this, uh, this country. They were printing paper money that wasn't backed up with silver, wasn't backed up with gold, and that was a problem, just like the United States is doing. They were giving money away to countries like the United States and their foreign empire. They were giving away money and getting into wars that were unnecessary, that were unhelpful, and they definitely did not profit them in any way. And all of that led, in part, to the French Revolution. Right? So we have um, political, uh, financial, and social crisis that all kind of hit all at once. And doesn't that sound similar to what the United States is experiencing today. Uh, we have massive division. We have greed and envy happening all across the United States. Uh, listen, to, listen to this scandal. This is one of the scandals that uh, provoked the French Revolution, the necklace scandal. Basically, uh, the, the queen ordered a, uh, a necklace, a very, very expensive necklace, and uh, uh, did not, uh, allegedly did not pay for it, right? And so that, that happened, and this, uh, it was kind of blown out of proportion in some ways from, from what we can tell in history. Uh, it was maybe misreported a bit. But the thing is, it got the crowds going. It got people very agitated, very uh, upset, and very um, uh, talking uh, about uh, replacing their government because of that, right? And um, so 1.3 billion levers in debt, massive paper printing, they had massive inflation happening. Um, I tried tracking down how much uh, 1.3 billion levers was, was uh, back then. And the simple fact is that, uh, that they changed their value of their currency against silver and gold so rapidly over the, the course of that 100 years that it was just like impossible for me to figure out how much 1.3 billion levers was actually worth back then. Um, so it was worth a lot. That's what it was. And that led directly into the French Revolution. Some of the ideas from the American Revolution filtered into France, of course, uh, brought in by some of the revolutionaries like Benjamin Franklin and, uh, and the others. But uh, all that to say that this country potentially imploded in large part due to financial issues, overspending, spending on foreign wars, spending on foreign adventures, and also um, uh, just uh, getting involved in those foreign wars in the first place, right? So hopefully that was uh, useful and enlightening to you uh, here in France. Um, like I said, uh, I believe in the morning's video, I tried to get a lot closer, but uh, they just have this whole place locked down. Um, they, not really for the people, it's mostly for the politicians. And that was a whole big scandal happening here in France, uh, how they were cleaning up the river uh, for the events. And people were like, hey, why don't, why don't you normally clean up the river? <laughs> um, and uh, people were talking about like, they're so upset with the mayor that they were going to uh, go, go the bathroom in the river upstream uh, before the mayor got into the river uh, to prove how clean it was. Uh, he, they were going to make it unclean uh, for him. And they, uh, one place upstream, they actually put a protest up where they uh, had the whole uh, river lined with toilets uh, that kind of like were set up to overhang the, uh, the, the river. Uh, I don't think people were actually using them, but I think it was like just making the point that people were very unhappy with, uh, with that whole thing. So, all right, friends, um, we're going to be heading up to Normandy very shortly. Um, I'm going to grab a little quick bite to eat and then hop on a uh, hop on my way up to the train uh, to get out of here. But um, thanks so much for watching. If you want to check out another video from this channel, there's one right up here. I'll see you over there, or I'll see you guys later. Steve Poplar of the Poplar Report, out.